This is the All Thinking Podcast by Nine Point Partners. We are on the brink of a new sort of epoch where technology is kind of reimagining everything that is possible. And there's a lot of promise in this future, and there's a lot of peril for people that don't understand or embrace the potential. Companies like Starbucks or MasterCard or Pepsi are embracing these tools wholeheartedly because they see, as with other eras of the web, that this new era of the web, Web3, is going to have as great, if not a greater impact than previous eras of the web. The Alt Thinking Podcast from Nine Point Partners begins now. Here is Michael Hainsworth. The next leap in internet technology is underway. And like how Web 2.0 was a massive evolution from the static pages of Web 1, Web 3 will address some of the issues of its predecessor. If data is the new oil, Web 3 will fundamentally change the way we view the ownership and value of our data. Alex Tapscott knows this. The author of Blockchain Revolution and the managing director of the Digital Asset Group at Nine Point Partners sees tremendous opportunity in what's coming next for financial services and investors. We began our conversation by defining Web3. In order to understand Web3, it's helpful to understand what came before it. So Web1, what we call now the Read Web, and what I think most people would remember as the dot-com era, was really a one-way static medium. It was a way to consume information digitally. And although it was primitive by today's standards, it nevertheless revolutionized things by basically making information readily available, at least to anyone with access to an internet connection. Um, in the early 2000s, technology evolved and our behavior online evolved, ushering in a new era of the web that we now know as Web 2. And Web 2, the common term is the read-write web. And basically all that means is the web is not just a way to consume information, it's a way to uh, consume information, but also to, to collaborate online, to communicate. And the defining sort of business model of Web 2 was a social media built on the back of user-generated content. But what ended up happening in Web 2 was all of the value that was created online, all of our data, our interactions, the impressions, the attention that we provided was captured asymmetrically by powerful forces, big social media companies, large tech conglomerates, uh, financial intermediaries, and others. So what Web 3 basically offers is a rethink. Web 3 is the read, write, own web. So not only is the web a way to consume information, not only is it a way to post information and to create content online, but it's also a way for us to actually own the things that matter online. And that means owning our own identities, owning our own data, and being able to transact in any kind of asset, whether it's a piece of art or security or money, peer-to-peer -peer without the need for powerful platforms and intermediaries. It represents a wholesale shift in how we think about the role of the internet user, from being an internet user to an internet owner. And that's a very important transformation that I think is going to impact basically every industry, from financial services to creative industries to civil society and even governments. So Web3 is designed to address some of the shortcomings of Web 2.0, where the data and the content are housed and controlled by what we now refer to as big tech, using uh, technologies like decentralization, blockchain, a token-based economics. Those are sort of the foundational technologies of Web3? Yeah, that's right. So the most important thing that's invented, that's been invented in Web3 is the token. Now, it's sort of a funny thing. The word token sounds kind of lighthearted, maybe almost trivial, but it turns out to be uh, both appropriate and a necessary term. You can think of tokens basically as containers for value in the same way that you can think of a website as a container for information. And that's a very important starting point because I think a lot of people, when they hear the words blockchain or Web3, immediately go to cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Uh, to be sure, Bitcoin is an important asset. It's worth hundreds of billions of dollars, but it represents the beginning and not the end of this story. So in the same way that a website um, can be programmed to basically display anything of information, whether it's, you know, the classifieds or the weather or sports scores or a search engine or content, media, and so forth, a token can be programmed to represent anything of value. And so in a way, it's kind of like this container, right? This blank slate that we can fill with anything of value and represent as an asset online. So that can be money, but it can also be 
financial assets like stocks and bonds, uh, titles and deeds. It can be art, collectibles, anything that requires scarcity to have value can be represented by a token. Now, tokens only uh, exist and are only possible because of the foundational technology, which is known as a blockchain. And a blockchain is basically just a way to program value and digital scarcity into assets. It's a way to represent value online without needing a trusted third party like a bank or you know, a big social media company or a big tech company to say so. And that's an important innovation that is going to decentralize um, ownership and power in uh, the economy and also online in a way that I think is going to upend a lot of those old business models. When I talk to audiences at conferences and trade shows about the metaverse, I explain that there are actually three metaverses. There's the industrial metaverse, the enterprise metaverse, and the consumer metaverse. And there's a lot of talk that the metaverse is dead, the consumer metaverse. Mark Zuckerberg laying off thousands of workers as seen as proof. But his problem is that he was trying to create a centralized metaverse, like how AOL tried to create a centralized web location for everything. It seems though we'll see many consumer metaverses and Web3 is expected to be one of those underlying technologies. I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. And I think that it's worth defining what the metaverse actually is. You know, it's a much hyped concept, but most thoughtful people still agree that it's going to be important culturally and economically quite significant. You know, the investment bank, Citibank and, and Morgan Stanley estimate the value that's going to be created to be in the trillions of dollars over the next decade. But I think when a lot of people see the word metaverse, they think of virtual worlds or video game. And that is only sort of partially true. You know, I think that virtual reality and augmented reality is going to be more important in how we interact with the Internet. And that's not just my idea. That's something that we've seen play out over the decades. If you think about Web 1, the primary way we interacted with Web 1 was via desktop computers and the web browser, right? That's why it's known as the dot com era, because that's the you know identifier for a website. The second era of the web, Web 2, really was more accessed via smartphones and via uh, applications, mobile applications. And so the defining businesses like social media are things that we now primarily access on our mobile devices. Uh, so it does make sense that at some point, the hardware interface for the web is going to change. So we had computers, then we had smartphones, what comes next? And it, it is very likely that at some point, augmented reality or virtual, virtual reality will be part of that story. And we've even seen companies like Apple announce that they're soon to unveil their own augmented reality headsets. However, just because you're accessing the web by a virtual reality or augmented reality, doesn't, in my opinion, mean that you're accessing the metaverse in the true sense of the word. What you're really accessing are closed, controlled, virtual environments that are governed by corporations. And that's okay, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going to Disney World, um, <laughs> another closed environment that's controlled by a corporation. But when you enter Disney World, you sort of turn over any sort of sense of meaning or, or, or any kind of rights that you would you know, have in the real world. And if you're the father of a six-year-old, your sanity. Yeah, yeah, you definitely check your sanity at the door. <laughs> and uh, and also, I've heard like five to $10,000 just to have a decent family trip. To mm -hmm. But that's an aside. So what we really need to do for this new virtual plane of existence, however you want to define it, is basically just bring some of the things that matter in the real world online and into this virtual world. So that means... Uh, rights, right? Rights to privacy, uh, property rights, the ability to own assets, the ability to freely transact uh, peer to peer without having to pay massive taxes to platforms. Right now, Facebook and Apple and others are looking at the metaverse as just another way to basically propagate the same model that existed in Web 2, where for if you're Apple, you're charging 30% every time an application is downloaded, any time a subscription is paid, any time an in-game asset is purchased through the App Store. That is a massive levy that, is, uh, that, that weighs on the economic activity online. So any metaverse that we do create needs to be one where users are empowered, where they control their own assets, and where they can transact peer-to-peer. -peer. That is all only possible with Web3 tools like tokens and with blockchains as the foundation. 
Otherwise, we're not creating a metaverse. We're not creating a new reality, uh, a new shared experience. We're just creating Disneyland online. So with all of that in mind, I, I want to talk about present day because metaverse is is sort of a thing that's coming. It's not quite here yet. It's going to be a little while. You know, we've got this new Apple headset that's coming out quite shortly, but that is only going to be the beginning of that aspect of Web3. Let's talk about more practical applications of Web3 and what it means for your world at Nine Point Partners. You know, I mentioned decentralization, blockchain, and these token-based economics have a huge role to play in the evolution of the financial services sector. One of the areas, perhaps unsurprisingly, where this technology is having the most immediate impact is in, in financial services. And it makes sense in a way. Web 1 and Web 2 were different from each other, but were both mediums for information. They were ways to access, to share, and to propagate information. What's different about Web 3 is that it is a medium for value or for assets. So what industry do we think of when we think of value and assets, financial services? Now, there's been lots of digital innovation in financial services over the past half century, starting first with, you know, the Diners Club card <laughs> and, uh, and leading all the way up now to today, what we know as sort of fintech or financial technology. But most financial technology or fintech innovation that we have seen isn't trying to get to the root of what the industry does. It's basically creating a new sleek user interface to access the old institutions and the, and the old ways of doing things. So in a way, it's kind of like digital wallpaper on the, on the old edifice of financial services. It's a fresh coat of paint that's sort of concealing some of the more antiquated parts of that industry. What Web3 and its financial sector, known as DeFi or decentralized finance, is trying to achieve is a wholesale rethink of the, the core uh, purpose of financial services. So, you know, the industry is kind of bewildering to some people. You know, the leaders of it are known as the masters of the universe, and it is the lifeblood of our, of our global economy. But fundamentally, it does uh, several basic things, right? It gives people a way and people and businesses a way to move money, a way to store money, a way to access credit, a way to insure against risk a way to transact and trade financial assets and other things like commodities, a way to connect investors with entrepreneurs, uh, with sources of risk capital, a way to organize financial information, a way to establish identity, and so forth. And this is a taxonomy that, that we've developed and, um, and uh, appears in, uh, in my new book and informs our investing decision making here at Nine Point quite closely. And so if you look at DeFi, there are there are digitally native companies and organizations that are basically recreating a lot of these functions of financial services. So take payments as an example. In the past several years, we've seen an explosion in a new kind of asset known as a stable coin. Now, not all stable coins are created equal, but as a whole, the industry has grown to over $100 billion in value. And basically, all a stablecoin is, is a digital asset that is backed by some other kind of asset. And this, in most cases, a U.S. dollar. And, and it creates easy ways for individuals and businesses to move money instantly around the world. You might think that doesn't sound like a big innovation, but today, most businesses and individuals rely on organizations like SWIFT and the correspondent banking network to move money around the world. And it can take days, sometimes weeks to settle transactions and cost uh, quite high fees. Stablecoin transactions, by contrast, are instantaneous or near instantaneous and nearly free. And that kind of innovation, subtle as it might seem, is going to basically completely disrupt a huge part of the business model of banks and other financial intermediaries. Oh, and by the way, it's going to create ways for people all around the world, whether they have a bank account or not, to move and store and perhaps even earn interest on US dollars. And that's something that is going to be a huge boon to many people around the world, especially those living in the global south. That sort of segues into what I want to talk about next, because that's financial services. What about the financial markets themselves? How do you think Web3 is going to disrupt the markets? There's a couple of ways to think about that. The thing that, that most interests me is how Web3 enables kind of new models and new business models and, and new kinds of markets that weren't really possible before. So we think about the, the corporation, you know, the company as being this defining feature of, of modern capitalism. And in a way, it, it's sort of like the killer app for capitalism, the corporation. It's a way to 
pool capital to conduct, you know, large capital intensive exercises. So the first companies were launched to, you know, send ships across the ocean or to build railroads or to dig mines and so forth. Big capital intensive industrial era type activities. Now we have these new kinds of organizations known as DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations that instead of having shareholders have token holders and those token holders can be anywhere around the world. Um, they can buy into those organizations or they can earn buy, earn a share in them by being a user or customer or, um, of a company or of a project. And to me, that is a kind of new and novel framework that I think is much more suited to our digital age because, you know, most, most organizations, most software applications, for example, don't begin as local companies, right? They're not trying to tackle the Toronto market first before moving somewhere else. They're trying to build something that is ubiquitous and that can be used by anyone. And now we have a new toolkit to allow people who are early users of these platforms to actually become owners of those platforms. And to me, that is an incredibly powerful um, paradigm shift that is going to, I think, help to fuel the growth of a lot of these new kinds of organizations. So that's not to say, by the way, that tomorrow Enbridge or an Apple or Royal Bank is about to become a DAO. You know, it took decades, if not centuries, to migrate from agrarian based economies to industrial economies. And so it'll take a very long time to migrate from this industrial area concept of a company to something that's digitally native. But I do think that many of the new kinds of organizations that uh, will launch in this industry and in others are going to use this. And in fact, we've already seen that almost every single startup in Web3 today begins as one of these digitally native organizations that doesn't have a cap table with shareholders, but rather has a token a holder base that is global in nature. So I think that's one thing that's very interesting. In terms of financial markets as a whole, I think that with it, as with any other technology revolution, there are going to be big winners and, and big losers. And that's true for publicly traded companies as well. You know, on the one hand, you can make the case that this technology stands to disrupt a lot of legacy business models. As I've explained, this new primitive known as tokens can uh, replace or disrupt a lot of um, traditional models. But at the same time, I also think that as with other technologies, there's a huge opportunity to harness these tools to improve your business in pretty profound ways. So in the public markets, you know, maybe financial intermediaries and banks um, see their impact and their influence uh, decline over time as more peer-to-peer -peer models supplement the existing centralized models of, of traditional finance. But for a lot of technology companies, perhaps harnessing these tools creates new ways to target new users, to build new markets, to, um, to connect with customers in more profound ways. And that's why we're seeing this huge explosion of enterprise adoption of Web3. And I think that's something that surprises a lot of people when they find out that companies like Starbucks or MasterCard or Pepsi um, or PayPal or Microsoft, for that matter, are embracing these tools wholeheartedly. Because they see, as with other eras of the web, that this new era of this web, of the web, Web3, is going to have as great, if not a greater impact than previous eras of the web. And if they position themselves accordingly for this next era of growth, they stand to benefit significantly. So you give investors an opportunity to participate in the next generation internet with the Web3 Innovators Fund. How's it managed? Uh, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> great segue. <laughs> I love to talk about the big ideas, but it's important also to talk about what we're trying to do here at Nine Point. So the Web3 Innovators Fund, in our view, gives investors uh, broad exposure to all of the transformations that are happening in, in Web3 today. So a lot of transformations in Web3 are happening at the digital asset or the token level. And the, and the fund and its strategy will get exposure to digital assets and to the growth of that asset class directly and also indirectly through businesses that are um, fully leveraged to that industry. But we also want to make sure that we are capturing some of these other companies that are embracing this toolkit to transform their business. And so we will be casting a wide net. We'll be remaining very focused on Web3 and, and the kinds of transformations that I've described. But we'll be casting a fairly wide net so that we don't miss out on any kinds of opportunities that arise. So the fund itself, the strategy as, as we see it, gives investors a simple, low fee way to get exposure to Web3, both Web3 and digital assets and Web3 for business across a range of public securities in a format, an ETF that 
anybody can own. And that's something that, uh, in my view, doesn't, no other strategy or fund that I've seen does everything that we do or uh, does it, in my view, as well as we do. And so we're really excited to bring this to market as a way for investors to participate in this transformation. You know, you, you can think about Web3 today as sort of being on the same stage as Web1 was in the, the mid-1990s. You know, in the mid-1990s, there were a couple of companies that had already distinguished themselves. You'd mentioned America Online, for example. And so it would have made sense logically to say, well, if I want exposure to the internet, I should buy shares of America Online. Sure, that made sense. But what, what made more sense was actually to take a portfolio approach because one single asset is not representative of an entire transformation that is going on. And that's why I think owning just Bitcoin, for example, while useful in the context of a portfolio, is a little limiting because you're going to miss out on all the other kinds of innovation that's happening in, in this industry today. So it would have been smart to take a portfolio approach then, and it makes sense to do so today as well. And also another thing I'll add, which is that in the 1990s, you know, the leading companies in the world were not technology companies. They weren't even technology hardware manufacturers necessarily. And they certainly weren't internet companies. They were large industrial uh, organizations and financial services firms, you know, GE, JP Morgan, companies like that. And today, um, the biggest companies in the world are all pretty much Web2 platforms, right? They are Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and others. And so as at the time in the 1990s, you, know, you would have put a couple of percent into the internet stocks. And at the time, they were speculative because it was early stage. But over time, they they came to capture a huge share of the total value of all uh, you know publicly traded equities because the internet itself was consuming so much of the economy, right? And I think the same thing is true today. So the Web3 fund today you know, represents a relatively small part, uh, I think, of, of a total portfolio approach. But over time, if we're right, it's going to consume a big part of the economy just as prior eras of the web did. And so I think that's a useful sort of framework to use when thinking about it. So much to dig into here. What do you say we make this a two-part series, have you back, talk about the top Web3 firms, dig deeper into what it means for investors? Work for you? Sounds great. So then what would you say the key takeaway for this conversation should be for the listener? Well, the key takeaway is that the web and with it, the internet are entering a new era. And this transformation comes at a pretty important time because we are on the brink of a, of a new sort of epoch where technology is kind of reimagining everything that is possible. And there's a lot of promise in this future and there's a lot of peril for people that don't understand or embrace the potential. And so what we want to do and what we've always done at the Nine Point Digital Asset Group is to lead first with education, to help to guide uh, investors, clients, um, and others who are curious about this subject along in their journey so that they can understand this potential and they can position themselves for that future. You've been listening to the Alt Thinking Podcast by Nine Point Partners. For more alternative investing ideas, insights, and strategies, subscribe by visiting ninepoint.com. The opinions, estimates, and projections contained within this recording are solely those of Nine Point Partners and are subject to change without notice. Nine Point makes every effort to ensure that the information has been derived from sources believed to be reliable and accurate. However, Nine Point assumes no responsibility for any losses or damages, whether direct or indirect, which arise out of the use of this information. These views are not to be considered investment advice, nor should they be considered a recommendation to buy or sell. Investment funds are not guaranteed. Their values change frequently and past performance may not be repeated. Important information about the Nine Point Partners funds, including investment objectives and strategies, purchase options and applicable management fees and other charges and expenses expenses is contained in their respective prospectus or offering memorandum. Please read these documents carefully before investing. We strongly recommend that you consult your investment advisor for a comprehensive review of your personal financial situation before undertaking any investment strategy. For more information, visit ninepoint.com legal.